So hi guys, it's me Raylin Tarongoy from the group 9 discussing about the history of Cebu, reminiscing its beginnings. So we are here to continue the discussion and now we are here in the part wherein we are going to get to know these people who are essential to the local history of Cebu. So the first one is Julio Lorente y Abalia. So here, I'm going to use the laser printer here. So Julio Lorente y Abalia. Y Abalia. So a Spanish um, counterpart name there, wherein the middle name was the last. As to the last name is where it is in the middle. No. So if in today's name pronunciation or name terminologies, we're going to call him Julio Abalie Lorente. So now, he was the first governor of Cebu and the only Cebuano propagandist in Spain. So he happened to migrate in Spain for a short period of time because he's he was studying there. I don't... There are no details no there were no enough information as to what was his course so what did he took up when he was studying there so he left for Spain to study at the Universidad Central de Madrid so he worked closely with Rizal and Marcelo H. del Pilar for a committee that will work for the unification of the Filipino groups in Madrid in 1891 Lorente was back in Cebu. So, he was back in Cebu. He became Segundo Teniente or Second Lieutenant of the Ayuntamiento of Cebu and its Justice of the Peace. He was imprisoned at the Horta de Cebu, tried by the military court, and sentenced to die. Segismondo Moret, or the, an ex-minister of the colonies, Spanish colonies, intervened and had him freed. So, thankfully, no? Segismondo Moret, an ex-minister, from Spanish colony intervened and had him freed. So I am thinking that he had these connections when he was in Spain that uh, granted him this luck no, to be freed from a death sentence. So he then replaced the outgoing President Luis Flores as the president of the Provincial Council of Cebu on April 16, 1899. So he took oath of office as the first civil governor of Cebu and then of South. So we're going to move on to the next. Juan Foller, Foller, Foller or Foller Climaco. Climaco. So he was the second governor of Cebu. Cebu has been honored by a street named after him. It traverses the streets starting from Magallanes, Dimasalang, Borromeo, and Sanxiangco. Climaco was born on December 24, 1859 in Toledo, Cebu, so a day before the Christmas. He was called the brains of the resistance before the revolution against the Spaniards in Cebu. One was appointed as Gobernador Silio of Toledo, so Gobernador Silio like uh, a town in a municipality. He was fondly called by the people of Toledo as Tanhantoy, short for Capitan, when the Revolutionary Junta, a military or political group that rules a country after taking power by force, was established by Luis Flores. He was appointed as Chief of Staff, while General Arcadio Molero Maximum was the commanding general of the army, so he succeeded Julio Lorente as the governor of Cebu. There were not much of information about his life way back then, so this was this was only the details that we have summed up in order to get to know who this person was. So Luis Luis Flores y Perez. Luis Flores y Perez is a native of Samar. So he was from somewhere like Leon Quilat, who was not a native of Cebu. Flores came to Cebu in 1891 as a steward of Bishop Martin Garcia Alcocer, 
With Alcocer's patronage, he served as procurador or an attorney of the Cebu Odentia or the town municipal also, just like that, as well as regidor of the Cebu Ayuntamiento. He became one of the earliest Cebuanos to enter the Katipunan and later on became one of the leaders in leading the 1898 revolution in Cebu. So, not specifically saying, but maybe, no, maybe, just maybe, uh, he was one of the Katipuneros who fought alongside with Leon Quilat in the Battle of Tres de Abril and also the, in the Battle of Tuburan also, maybe. However, there were no details as to those uh, incidents, but then here it stated that he was one of the leaders. So during the revolution, he became known as Unos or Storm in Cebu, or in Storm in Cebuano. Sorry. So going back, there is a phrase we called Nom de Guerre. So this Nom de Guerre was a nickname, sort of a nickname that uh, given to a specific people you know, which he uses in when he is in a combat or and yes some sort of a nickname given not a common nickname no it's a special nickname for someone who is combating people or in a combat no? so the choice was between saving Cebu by surrendering it to the Americans or wrecking destruction on the city by resisting the foreigners. Those who opted to surrender were considered as collaborators and those who opted to fight led a resistance that lasted until 1901. General Max Long and Juan Kling Mako belonged to the second group, so they chose to wreck, to wreck destruction on the city by resisting the foreigners. However, Luis Flores and Julio Lorente belonged to the first one, so they opted to to uh do we call this um do we call this uh they surrendered it to the americans no? because they maybe they did not want to further cause casualty to our fellow filipinos so, this is a commemorative event that happened on March 26, 1945. So, which is Pagdaong Satalisa in 1945. Okay. So, it, this emphasizes the arrival of the Americans in order to free the people and the provinces of Cebu from invasions of Japanese commanded by Captain Albert T. Sprague. Or Sprague or Spray, something like that. Before the landing, the Cebu guerrilla force of 8,500 men and an extensive intelligence network in the province alerted the American troops of the Japanese forces' plan to scatter landmines in the projected landing areas to delay the American advance. So, the guerrilla forces in Cebu, they were the ones who uh, gave a warning or gave a signal to the American troops that there were Japanese forces in the area planting landmines so that they might cause damage to the American troops and they might disrupt these American troops in invading the lands that these Japanese forces invaded. So, armed with this knowledge, the Americans together with the Cebuano guerrillas under Colonel James M. Cushing overcame the obstacle and proceeded to liberate Cebu City. So, with that knowledge, you no, know, they had the advantage. So they were able to is to escape these landmines. Uh, were in there, were in there were a lot of landmines, and they used this information in order to avoid these attacks. So the landing in Talisay was part of the Operation Victor the Second, which was implemented by L. T. G. Robert Eichel. Berger's 8th Army to take the island of Cebu, Bohol, and Negros from the enemy forces. It paved the way to the liberation of Cebu on 27 March 1945. 
and the surrender of the Japanese force in the province on 29 August 1945. So, two days later, they surrendered to the Americans. So, according to a blog written by one Central Hotel, not much has been written about the revolution in Cebu. The Americans, of course, suppressed local attempts to recall that 1898 revolution afraid that might inspire anti-colonial sentiments during the early years of their rule. It was not until around the 1930s, in the wake of the clamor for independence, that local veterans and eyewitnesses began publishing their own account. Among this was the book Ang Subo sa Karaang Panahon by Felix Sales, which came out in 1935. So, this is where we should uh, focus. No. That Americans actually, they actually control the Filipino people in recalling or uh, reminiscing the 1898 revolution because they were afraid they were afraid that these filipino people might start an uprising against them and so they tried to suppress the anti-colonial sentiments you know by uh, by stopping the filipino people of thinking about the uh, past uprisings and however they did not succeed because later on years went by there were local veterans and eyewitnesses that started publishing their own accounts this dirt of local historical accounts resulted in the impression that the Katipunan revolt was limited only to Manila and the rest of the zone particularly the eight provinces represented in the Philippine flag. Fortunately, contemporary historians are starting to fill the gap. Writers like Vasil Mojares, Michael Kulinani, and Emil Hustimbaste. Emil Hustimbaste was the one who authored the book Leon Kilat, The Untold Story of the 1898 Cebu Revolution. Recounted these turbulent years in Cebu's struggle against colonial rule with new research. And so mark the importance of this historic day. Emilio Stimbastes Leon Hilat Nantol story of the 1898 Cebu Revolution is going to be launched today at exactly 3 in the afternoon. So this was a blog by One Central Hotel, a hotel in the Cebu which, uh, which gave importance to the heritage, to the history that we have to a rich history that this the Cebu have no the time that trust the Abril attack began at the newly opened palm grass hotel near the corner of Conquera and the Sanchanco streets so near the streets were in there were there were the names of the previous people that we've talked about were uh, derived from you know, like Luis Flores and Julio Lorente or it could be Climaco. So the Cebuano Heritage themed hotel owned by the descendants of Isidro Gibelondo, the Spanish mestizo lawyer at whose house the Tres de Abril revolt was planned in 1898 is the publisher of this new book on Leon Quilat by Justin Baste. Descendants of other revolutionaries are also invited as palm grass honors. These heroes with a large class, wall etched with their names at the Hotel Cebu History Team, Galeria Independencia. So, if you will ask me why did I uh, include these, this blog in our report, it's because there is something that I want you to know, that the Americans are actually not the angels we have thought about no they were not the ones who liberated us it is us who liberated ourselves it is just the fact that they played with our minds no? they were able to cycle us and made us to believe that they were the better better country the better state however they were just alike to the spanish the spaniards so Thankfully, to these people, like Rizil Mojares, 
my kinkulinan to the other people who actually had the courage to to reveal their accounts about the past events, past historic events. It is a great blessing to have them because they were part of us, the Cebuanos, who have love for our country and for our province. So, we are going to go to the other essential points to ponder. So, let's go to the education. This is in colonial period now, not in the pre-colonial period. So, the tribal tutors were replaced by the Spanish missionaries. Education was religion-oriented. It was for the elite. Especially in the early years of Spanish colonization, access to the education by the Filipinos was later liberalized through the enactment of the Educational Decree of 1863, which provided for the establishment of at least one primary school for boys and girls in each town under the responsibility of the municipal government. And the establishment of a normal school for male teachers under the supervision of the Jesuits. Primary instruction was free and the teaching of Spanish was compulsory. Education during that period was inadequate, suppressed, and controlled. So this was from the DepEd government each website. However, there were some accounts. I did not uh, I did not include these accounts. No, but I have I have read that Education in Spanish period, no, it was only for the elites and for the people who were in families like the Ilustrados or the Principalias. However, there are also some accounts that some Jesuits, no, some Jesuits, they taught people, Filipino people, free back in the day. It was just like we do not know what is the truth no we are only basing for the details that are presented before us so an adequate secularized and free public school system during the first decade of american rule was established upon the recommendation of the scoreman commission this was in the american american period Free primary instruction that trained the people for the duties of citizenship and advocation was enforced by the Taft Commission per instructions of President McKinley. Chaplains and non-commissioned officers were assigned to teach using English as the medium of instruction. So only English, no Philippine in language or even Spaniards or even Spanish language. So a highly centralized public school system was installed in 1901 by the Philippine Commission by virtue of Act No. 74. The implementation of this act created a heavy shortage of teachers, so the Philippine Commission authorized the Secretary of Public Instruction to bring to the Philippines 600 teachers from the USA. So they were the Thomasites. So for me, these were the kind of like reminded me now from the elementary books that we have read these thomasites they were the uh they were the origin of the university of santo thomas because they were the thomasites however they were also uh, i have that actually read that part so i'm not going to deep deeper so, in religion, the main motive of Spanish is red Christianism, of course. So, Catholicism is their religion. As for the Americans, mostly of the teachers sent to teach in the Philippines were reported Protestants. They could be the one who spread the Protestant Christianism. So, Protestant Christianism, they have a lot of sectors. However, we're not going to dig deeper. So, let's proceed with the writing system. Filipinos were taught the Latin alphabet, so Spaniards, Spanish time, and Spanish language by Spanish missionaries who acted as the island's first teachers. The first ever book written and printed in the Philippines, Doctrina Cristiana 1593, 
English is Christian doctrine. So, is one example of this wherein the Latin alphabet was first used to explain the fundamental values of Christianity and Christian prayers in Spanish. Filipinos were introduced to the English language in its 26-letter alphabet at the end of Spanish rule and the arrival of American-style public education during the American era. Today, English is more widely taught in schools than Spanish. So, it is really evident though. So, despite this, the abecedario remained in use as many places still use Spanish letters. Eventually, the letters of the abecedario were modified into the official Philippine alphabet known as abacada. So, abecedario was from uh, Spanish language. So, let's proceed to the local government system. During the Spanish colonization in the Philippines, the government was composed of two branches, the executive and the judicial sector only. There was no legislative branch at that time since the laws of the islands were coming from the Spain, from the king of Spain himself. The only laws created in the Philippines are those who were ordered by the governor general. The government on that time was leaded, was led by the governor general. He was considered as the representative of Spain and the king himself. He is the highest officer in the island and responsible for implementing laws from the mother country. He also has the power to appoint or relieve officer in the government or priest in the parish, except with those personally appointed by the king of Spain. The provinces in the island were called as encomienda and were governed by the encomienderos. Later, they were replaced by the alcalde mayor who had both the executive and judicial power. Small towns were governed by the gobernador Silio. Under his authority were one police chief and the lower government employees from which he had jurisdiction. Gobernador Silio were elected by the married people but later a gobernador Silio was chosen by those outgoing in the position as his Replacement. The city was governed by two mayors, two, 12 councillors, and a police chief. A secretary and other employees, the city is called as Ayuntamiento. So this website was from the Philippine government during Spanish colonial period. Meanwhile, the U.S. Congress approved the Philippines Act on July 1, 1902, which provided the Philippines with limited self-government. The U.S. government replaced the military government in the Philippines with a civilian government headed by William Howard Taft on July 4, 1902. So, moving forward to Spanish influences in Cebu, due to the 333 years of Spanish colonization, our ancestors mostly did adapt to the way of living of the foreigners who invaded our land, and so, Influences which were greatly imposed way back then due to their immense control and abusive hold on us happened to be part of the everyday, of the everyday lives of our people. So, language is the first one in our list. The most significant Spanish influence is seen in the Philippine language, particularly in Tagalog. So, in other regional languages. Spanish words known as loan words because we often borrow words from them are prevalent comprising approximately 4,000 words in the Filipino vocabulary. The culture, Spanish influence is evident in various aspects of Filipino culture including music, dance, cuisine, and traditional attire. Many traditional Filipino dances such as the Tinikli and Pandango have Spanish influences in their movements and rhythms. So, additionally, Spanish culinary techniques and ingredients like adobo, paella, and lechon have become integral parts of Filipino cuisine. Governance and law, the Spanish colonial administration introduced a centralized, centralized, there, there's also a decentralized government system, there's also a centralized government system. With a focus on local governance through the encomienda and later the cabildo system. 
the Spanish legal system based on civil law who also had a lasting impact on Philippine laws and legal practices. Architecture, Spanish architecture left a mark on the Philippines through the construction of churches, government buildings, and residential structures. Spanish influenced structure, characterized by thick walls, ornate, ornate facades, and the extensive use of wood and stone, is particularly prominent in colonial era churches found throughout the century. So, oftentimes these buildings or infrastructures with stones and more on woods they were from spanish like influence so festivals and celebrations many philippine festivals and celebrations have roots in spanish religious traditions like sinulo also the most notable is the annual sinulo festival okay so that is what i have mentioned and which honors the Santo Nino or the holy image, the image of the holy child, child Jesus, and features vibrant street processions and cultural performances. So that is all for this video. I hope you learned a lot from this video no? because we are really something. This one is really something and I know that there were a lot of things to include in this before. However, I am really, really sorry that we weren't able to include all the things. If only we could, we have, we could, we would, you know. And so, thank you for watching this video. I hope that we have shared a lot of new ideas and we have... Uh, we have ignited a flame in our hearts today. Thank you and please, 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 please spread the news, press spread about these Cebuano uprisings events because these will maintain our culture and our history as Cebuanos altogether. That is all. Thank you.